you see about $900 trillion of capital. Over time, governments are always vying to, uh, to take it from other governments. They're vying to take it from corporations. And so there's a never ending competition between governments, countries, corporations, institutions, families, and individuals over money and over economics. And what you see is $900 trillion divided by, by various asset classes. And Bitcoin, as of the summer, was about a $500 billion asset class. Now, the most important thing to understand is that governments are increasing their wealth either by passing laws or by printing currency. The price of Bitcoin is hovering right above 41,700. We've also seen the BTC supply hit the lowest since 2017. This is on the heels of declining trust in exchanges following Binance's recent legal troubles and last year's FTX collapse. Today, we are joined by Michael Saylor, who shares his insights into the price action and market dynamics for Bitcoin and why he's bullish in 2023. Saylor's positive sentiment is firmly rooted in two key factors, the upcoming Bitcoin halving event set for April and the impending approval of a Bitcoin spot ETF by the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Currently, the SEC is actively reviewing multiple applications for this ETF. Thanks to BlackRock's significant influence, there's an increasingly strong belief that, in the not-too-distant future, we'll witness the approval of at least one Bitcoin spot ETF. This would mark an historic milestone for the Bitcoin community, a moment many have been eagerly awaiting for well over a decade. The green light for such an ETF would carry profound implications for the world of cryptocurrency and would serve as the gateway to substantial institutional investments, drawing interest from sovereign wealth funds, major corporations and even governments. Saylor envisions that this development will pave the way for large corporations to incorporate cryptocurrencies into their balance sheets. Let's get right into the latest interview with Michael Saylor and why Bitcoin is poised to revolutionize 2023 and the imminent transformations we can anticipate in the crypto market. Also, we have just partnered with our friends over at Jamie Tree Finance, who have just launched a daily five-minute crypto newsletter. It's a fantastic analysis of on-chain crypto data and breakdowns, and the best part, it's absolutely free, which will cover expert predictions, breakdowns of on-chain crypto data, and any breaking news that you need to know, all in a nutshell. Click the first link in the description and enter your email to join over 5,000 others in becoming a better crypto investor right now. So we could start with an observation in, in this entire last 100 years. The world reserve currency, the US dollar, is collapsing versus assets such as the S&P index. The S&P is 500 of the most valuable companies in the United States or maybe the world. It's collapsing against real estate, against gold, against art. And it's hard to see this over the course of a year or two or three years. But if you look over the course of a century, I find it to be very clarifying. And on average, what you find is the United States dollar is losing 7% of its value each year for the last 100 years. Now, um, if you look at government statistics in the United States, they will tell you that the inflation rate is about 2%, and they'll show you a graph like this, which shows that the dollar has gone from has lost you know something like 94 percent or 95 percent of its purchasing power over this hundred years but that's based upon the consumer inflation rate consumer inflation is the lowest inflation rate it's a market basket of goods that are easy to manufacture with a machine or they're easy to print or they're very um they're not labor intensive they're information intensive like watching youtube videos or boxed starch or things manufactured. This is the lowest inflation rate. In fact, the, the, uh, the producer price index is a higher inflation rate and the asset inflation rate is higher. So it's a mistake to think that $26 in 1910 is, or 1920 is worth a $1 in 2020. In fact, if you look at the US dollar versus um, other assets, you can see it's losing value at a much more rapid rate. So the consumer goods rate is 93%, minus 93%, that, that's this chart. The US dollar versus gold has lost 99% of its value. 
we went from $20 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce, and so 99%. And the US dollar against the S&P index, which is the US dollar against a corporation of a successful competitive company, uh, or the US dollar against Miami Beach real estate, has lost 99.8% of its value over those 100 years. Now that's not really well understood. Most people don't think the inflation rate is 7%, they think it's 2%, and the difference between two and seven is 93 versus 99.8, or 99.9. even Now, let's focus in on why the dollar loses value against real estate so rapidly. I'll show you a picture of Miami Beach. You see, what you notice is there's a fixed amount of beach and all those buildings on the beach are there because the value of an acre of land on that beach is 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Very expensive. In fact, the, the value of an acre in Miami Beach uh, about 90 years ago or 100 years ago was $10,000 an acre. And a few years ago, it was $10 million an acre. Today is $20 million, 1,000 to 2,000. Now, why is it that the price goes up so fast. It goes up much faster than the cost of a Big Mac or the cost of a cereal or the cost of a YouTube video. And the reason why is because only God can make more beachfront. Uh, politicians can't print more beach. You can't manufacture more beach with a factory. And AI can't create more beach on a silicon chip. There is no way to trick the world into there being more beachfront property. You can see it's a certain amount. It was that amount in 1930. It's that amount 100 years later. And so as the money supply expands, that price goes up proportionally. So that's a fair yardstick. And, and what you would say is the beachfront property is scarce, desirable property. The ongoing adoption of Bitcoin by governments, institutions and media signifies a broader recognition of its value. Me. However, Saylor asserts this journey is just beginning, comparing the initial years to the current widespread interest and investment with a giant spotlight on Bitcoin ETFs. Saylor highlights this being a significant development in the financial ecosystem. He also suggests that BlackRock, under the guidance of Larry Fink, will lead the charge in obtaining regulatory approval for a Bitcoin ETF. This move, he contends, will underscore Bitcoin's enduring relevance as an asset and its potential as a hedge against currency devaluation. If you want to preserve your wealth, an investor has to convert their currency into assets. And, you know, currency, CNY, euros, dollars, ARS, bolivars, real, etc. You have to convert them into assets that are scarce, desirable, portable, durable, and maintainable. Those are the five criteria that matter. And you have to evaluate every asset against that. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the most powerful digital monetary network in the world, but it, it is simultaneously four things. Bitcoin is an asset, it is a network, it is a protocol, and it is a ideology. And many people misunderstand it. They think, oh, it's just a cryptocurrency. But I think when you start thinking about asset, network, protocol, and ideology, your eyes open. Many people say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything. What's it backed for? It has no intrinsic value. And this, they grossly misunderstand the network. Bitcoin is secured by four types of power. Computing power, electrical power, economic power, and political power power. And if you don't understand these four types of power, then you're going to allow, someone's going to trick you out of your Bitcoin or you're going to make mistakes. So for example, the computing power is 460 exahash. That's all of these millions of Bitcoin miners, custom silicon, and they are channeling 16 and a half gigawatts of electrical power into 460 exahash. Now, 16.5 gigawatts is 20 basis points of the power in the world, so it's a small fraction. But 460 exahash is what makes Bitcoin truly secure because that's all the computer power in the world. 
If you wanted to redirect all the computers at Google and Amazon and Microsoft and all of the iPhones to do hashing of Bitcoin, they're probably not going to generate 460x a hash. So it's the it's the custom silicon which converts electrical power into computer power, and they're both important. Arguably, it's a lot easier to come up with 16 gigawatts than 460x a hash. Because all the hash power is owned by the Bitcoin companies that are securing the network. Now, to put this in perspective, 16 and a half gigawatts is is more power than the energy used to propel the entire United States Navy, all of the aircraft carriers, all the destroyers, all the ballistic subs. The entire Navy runs on a, a bit less than 16 and a half gigawatts. So that's a lot of power. 460x hash is all the computer power anybody else can muster. But that's not the only thing. Bitcoin is secured by economic power, and if you look at the four-year simple moving average of Bitcoin, and then you look at the supply, you conclude about 560 million, or sorry, 560 billion dollars have been invested in uh, the M is wrong. It's 560 billion dollars have been invested in in this network, and so that money secures the network. Um, and you got to expect that the people that invested the 560 billion are going to protect it using all of their resources and influence. And then finally, you've got about 220 million holders. 220 million people have some ownership of Bitcoin. And those 220 million people, they're also going to use their political influence uh, to protect the network. Saylor challenges the conventional macroeconomic metrics asserting that these metrics are often manipulated to paint a specific narrative, like labor statistics and inflation figures, which are selectively measured to create desired effects rather than reflecting the true state of the economy. In this context, Bitcoin emerges as an alternative, detached from the manipulations of the conventional economic sphere. Saylor also highlights that established corporations like Apple, Amazon, and Google will use their established relationships acquired over decades to swiftly acquire substantial amounts of Bitcoin through a spot ETF, bypassing the cumbersome processes involved in procuring the actual commodity. This disparity underscores the transformative power of cryptocurrencies in traditional financial institutions. Michael Saylor underscores the importance of embracing digital currencies as the economic landscape is changing rapidly and urges investors to leverage Bitcoin's potential to secure a more prosperous financial future. What do you think about the latest interview with Michael Saylor? And how do you think Bitcoin's trajectory in the coming months will impact the crypto market and the world of investing? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content just like this. We'll see you in the next video.